Home ownership has become increasingly out of reach for most Americans. For too many people, the dream of having a good home it still feels out of reach. I get it. This week on What's America Thinking, we're diving into the housing crisis, a huge concern for both Republican and Democratic lawmakers, and why the majority of people say the American dream of owning a home is dead. A recent Harris poll shows that while 81% of renters say they would like to own a home, 61% say they're worried they'll never be able to afford it. That poll also shows the biggest obstacles to the dream of home ownership are record high interest rates and not having enough cash. According to the Federal Reserve economic data, just 40 years ago, the average price of a home was more than $78,000, which is adjusted for inflation. That's about three and a half times what the average income was. But two years ago, the average price of a home had more than quintupled, $433,000, nearly six times the average income. The housing crisis has been affecting Americans across the country. Here's what some of you had to say. You know, the idea of like a starter home, I think is basically gone. It's uh, increasingly out of reach. <laughs> Even in Tulsa, uh, the, the rate that housing prices have increased has been pretty phenomenal, especially if there's unsustainable high interest rates too. I think in, in, in the States as well, uh, I can see that the mortgages and the interest rates are getting higher and higher every day. Um, a house that could have been purchased pre, you know, 2016, you know, is where I live at is going for two or three hundred thousand dollars more than what it did then. I do fear um, the younger generation, especially college students coming right out of college, um, you know, being sold a lot of times this dream of um, you know, anything's achievable, a lot of them are going to have a really hard time, you know, getting to that place their parents were able to get to much, much easier. If you're in some smaller southern, more rural areas, it seems affordable, but when you're in places like D.C. and New York and California, it can be extremely high. So, what's behind the unaffordable prices and sky-high inflation? Here to answer all of these questions is News Nation's business contributor, Gary B. Smith. Gary, thanks so much for being here. Just to kick this off, what's the number one issue causing homes to skyrocket right now? Well, you know, Julia, you hear a lot of reasons, but as usual, it's, you know, this is all economics and it's, it's just supply out there. A lot of people say the supply might be exacerbated by people, I suppose, like me, not wanting to move uh, and you know have to get a higher mortgage rate. But uh, yeah, there's there really is a lack of supply out there. We've been hearing a lot of about of a potential repeat of the 2008 housing market crash. Do you think this could happen again? Uh, in our lifetimes, yeah, sure. I, I imagine. But I don't think anytime soon, you know, you have to remember the 2008 housing crisis was fueled by easy credit and by a lot of speculation, especially in hot areas like Las Vegas, Phoenix, places like that. I just don't see that now. And remember, even the, this, the, the crash, if you will, in 2008, the prices only dropped about 10 percent, the median price. So it wasn't like 40, 50 percent. But are we going to get that kind of uh, pullback? I not in, not in the near term, I don't think. Right, right. So the National Association of Realtors just settled a case that, um, you know, alleged the industry worked to keep commissions artificially high. How much will this benefit home buyers? You know, uh, we're in the kind of the process of looking to sell our place and move. So I'm maybe a little bit closer than most people. I, and I've read a lot of articles saying, oh my gosh, you know, the prices are going to dramatically come down. I'm, I'm not so sure. Remember, the, you know, real estate agents still have a monopoly out there. There's very few people that, you know, sell by owner, if you will. And if I want to sell my place, you know, that I pay my, uh, the broker 6% as a seller, and then he or she splits it with the, uh, the buyer's agent, you know, that the agent in, in my place is going to still have to take a lot of pictures, have to market it, uh, maybe do open houses. It might be on the, it might be on, you know, his or her books for who knows, depending on the price, three, six, nine months. That's a lot of effort. And I think a lot of people are going to, you know, the, the 6% is, is worthwhile. Others though might say, geez, you know, everyone's finding it on Zillow. All I have to do is be here, have my agent here, 
you know, once a month or so, and I should be fine. So I, I think it's not going to have dramatic effect as most people think. You know, there's so many theories about why prices are so high when it comes to houses and homes, but the Congressional Joint Economic Committee says the high prices are at least partially due to a housing shortage. Do you think we're facing an availability pr crisis? Yeah, you know, it's funny. You read that document, which honestly is kind of a political document. I think the background is they want to get more government involvement in housing. And then you look at the National Association of Realtors puts out a, a document that says looks, you know, by metropolitan area all across the country. And they conclude with, you know, very few exceptions, supply is is fine out there. There is no uh, housing shortage. I guess it, I, I, you know, I just look in my area here in Jacksonville and across the board, I still see a lot of homes available and available for sale. And, you know, at quite reasonable prices. Maybe it depends on the area. If you're looking for, you know, $50 million condominiums in uh, Manhattan, yeah, maybe that supply is a little limited. <laughs> So on that note, actually, you know, obviously New York City is at one end of the spectrum. I'm coming from Washington, D.C. You're in Jacksonville. But how much do costs differ between cities and rural areas? And when I say cities, I don't necessarily mean just D.C. and uh, New York City, right. but also cities like Jacksonville, for example. Right. It, you know, it depends on the area. You know, Jacksonville is a great example because the the urban core, as they call it, of Jacksonville is actually very small, but the city is, well, it's the biggest city, you know, square mileage in the country. It's 950 square miles. So you can be in the city, but still kind of, you know, in, in versus other cities kind of be rural, if you will, and still within the city confines. So one, it depends on the city. Two, even, you know, generically, the prices don't differ as much as I thought they would, maybe about 10 percent, you know, even coming after the whole COVID where people exited these cities, the growth rate in prices for urban areas is still higher and the prices are a little bit higher. But generally, yeah, if you want a, a lower price and you're willing to be outside of a city, rural or let's just call it suburban, you're probably going to get a little bit better value. So I've spoken with a lot of friends who are millennials or Generation Z, and they've essentially expressed this concern of, I think I'll be renting forever. Um, you know, this is just something I'm going to have to accept. And there's also anecdotal, um, you know, p pieces of information that suggest a lot of millennials and people in Gen Z and maybe other generations are getting help to buy these homes from their family or, you know, some sort of a connection. How much are millennials and Gen Z individuals in particular having to rely on their families to, for help when purchasing a home? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, statistics are always interesting. I read where 38 percent of Gen Z get financial assistance from their parents, which sounds kind of hot. Yeah. But then you got to remember Gen Z, the home ownership is only about of the percentage of Gen Z population is only about three percent. So it's a very still small amount of homes out there. I I don't think that's a bad thing, by the way, uh, relying on your parents for assistance. But I'm not so sure that, you know, when they say, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have to rent for my entire life. You know, maybe we'll talk about this in a minute or so. I'm not so sure that's a terrible idea. Really, really? Could we dive in on that? Just you know, why renting isn't necessarily a terrible idea? Because I don't know. I, I've learned you know, home buying is is a good goal. But it, you know, talk about renting. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm not so sure. You know, I look back. So I've owned a home uh, in one or a condo, like I do now, for uh, let's see, almost uh, almost forty five years. And I look back and if I had taken the down payment that my wife and I put in our first home and instead just put it into the market and just left it there and instead paid, you know, the average apartment rate for a two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom as the kids got older, we'd still be a couple million dollars ahead. And here's the reason why, you know, people think, all right, I buy a home, you know, I build up all this equity. So we've had seven homes. We've lost money on four, made money on three. Then you add in 
property tax, higher property taxes, uh, homeowners insurance, maintenance, uh, 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 HOA fees, it, uh, lawn care. Home ownership is very, very expensive. I, I love living in all the homes that we have. It was great to raise our kids there, but if I had to do it over again, I and some would say, oh my gosh, you can great, get this great apartment, of which there are a lot more than there were when I first owned a home. I don't think it's such a bad trade-off. Right, right. And I just want to stay on this for a minute just because it's so fascinating to me and it's, you know, big in my, my uh, respective generation. But, you know, what do you say to the argument that if you're renting, particularly in a bigger city, you're just throwing thousands of dollars away each month? I mean, what's the counterpoint to that then? No, the counterpoint is that you don't have to pay you know, I guess the standard is you'd pay 20% down, if you will. I guess maybe mortgages vary now, but you know, say you, you wanted to buy a $500,000 place and you put down, you know, 100,000. That's 100,000. Then you bought an apartment. Yes, you're you're paying that whatever. Maybe a nice two bedroom around where I live is call it $2200. Mm -hmm. So you pay the 2200, which of course is gone every month, but you have the $100,000 in the bank or in a, in a mutual fund or something like that. You don't have to pay, um, you know, you have to pay, you know, uh, renter's insurance, but you don't have to pay to, you know, fix a house or, or repair a house if it gets blown away in a hurricane. You don't have to fix the lawn. You don't have to take care of the pool if you have one. So I'd say if you're just looking at a cost benefit analysis, like I say, you're, you might actually be better off renting. Right, right. So, and you mentioned two things there: the possibility of, you know, a hurricane or some sort of nat natural disaster, and insurance. You know, Fed Chair Jerome Powell said climate change is behind the reason why a lot of insurance companies refuse to insure homes in high-risk areas, which leave buyers without homeowners insurance um, unable to close. Ultimately, will we see more of this in the future, particularly in those high-risk areas? Well, first of all, I have to, just as a sidebar, I have to laugh. Now, everything is the fault of climate change. In actuality, uh, you know, companies like here in Florida, State Farm pulled out because they're losing money. It, it does, regardless of what caused, you know, the hurricanes, they, they're they losing money. When, when companies pull out then and they can't, they're not going to make any money, then homeowners insurance goes away. I'm not so, again, I'm not so sure that's a bad thing. People shouldn't be living in the areas where there's a high frequency of a hurricane destroying your home or a tornado wiping you out or a flood. You know, these people like in California that live along the coast where the coast is eroding and let's like, say Malibu, for example, they shouldn't be living there. <laughs> and if they do want to live there, then they have to get either, you know, private insurance, a self-insure or something like that, move to other parts of the country that are a little bit better. That's just... I think that's just good economic sense, if you will. Yeah, I guess it's a trade-off for that nice view of the Pacific Ocean for um, you know living in a eroded beach area. Look, Gary, we're in the 2024 election cycle right now. How much is this topic political? Can we expect President Biden and former President Trump to campaign on this? Um, you know, I I think they might, and and here's the reason why. Maybe Biden more than Trump. Look, I. Maybe I'm a, 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 a conspiracy theorist, if you will. I always think government likes to get into more businesses. Look, they already, you know, have Fannie Mae. They already have Sally Mae. They're pretty much in the the mortgage brokerage business. Why not try to get into the home ownership business? You know, they're pushing home ownership. I don't think they should be pushing home ownership versus renting a car or buying a car. But they seem to want to get into that as a way, quite honestly, to expand power. Um, I don't think it's on the top of their list of things to campaign about. I think it's more, you know, the war in Ukraine, immigration, of course, taxes. But I wouldn't doubt that it will come up. Absolutely. Well, Gary Smith, thank you for joining us and thank you for some good advice. I know that a lot of millennials and Gen Z individuals that will be listening to this. You bet, Julia. Thank you.